Shakespeare didn't come from nowhere. He was working in a time and a place that had a lot going on. And that's why I've decided to skip the next couple of very famous plays I was planning to get to, like Macbeth and Much Ado About Nothing, and instead think about what really shaped him. And so we're going to look at Titus Andronicus. This is Dr. Anna Camerali, and this is all strut, no fret, steps into Shakespeare. Shakespeare had a career that spanned roughly 20 years, so he wasn't always a master or famous or looked to by everyone as a genius. He was once upon a time a noob, and he kind of got into the business by being what we might call a script doctor now, that is taking plays that haven't quite worked for the stage and uh, fixing bits that needed fixing. He also did a lot of collaboration in his early years. And that's why it's great to look at a play from early in his career to get a sense of the mechanism, the scaffolding, the things he saw when he was learning about plays, about how they're built and how you deliver them to an audience. And so Titus Andronicus is a really useful play for us to examine, to see what Shakespeare did when he was learning how to write crowd pleasers. It also showed us which of Shakespeare's long-term obsessions were there from the beginning, which were the, the things that we see over and over again in the later, arguably more sophisticated or more polished plays that were already niggling at him in those early works. We're going to be focusing on the why aspect of this play. By looking at why Titus Andronicus is the way it is as a play, we'll also be able to think about why that's useful for us in understanding the trajectory of Shakespeare's career and also the distinctive features of the theatre of his era. What you're going to find with this play is the violence is extraordinary, but also that the speeches that accompany the progression of the action are really classically formed. So it's actually a wonderful play to look at the structure of the individual speeches given to characters because it's like they're built on all the principles that everyone who went through the school system that Shakespeare experienced would understand about the, the virtue of well-formed rhetoric. It's best if you take a glance at the earlier videos before this one. So that means the ones on Henry V, followed by Romeo and Juliet, followed by Twelfth Night. Now, if you go all the way back to Henry V, I talk a lot about rhetoric and I talk a lot about how the Elizabethan school system relied on teaching its pupils how to construct the perfect speech. We see the results of that education in a slightly different form in Titus Andronicus. It's like Shakespeare puts himself in the head of a series of really contrasting characters with vastly different experiences, personalities, points of view and goals. And he experiments to see if he can be equally persuasive no matter who it is who's talking to you, the audience. People usually come to Shakespeare with a feeling that they already kind of know what he's about. They're expecting most often something very grand, very poetical, very formal. And then you run up against something like Titus Andronicus. And their minds are blown. Titus Andronicus, absolutely soaked in bloodshed, comically strewn with body parts and elaborate schemes for murder and violation. And this sits so poorly with the place that Shakespeare holds in many people's imaginary ideas of, of what he did. It, it seems completely disconnected. But it's not at all. It's very much a part of who Shakespeare was and the world he was working within. Shakespeare was entirely a man of his time and place. He 
knew what his job was. He knew his job was to entertain a particular kind of public. And it was a public that shared with him a classical education relying on both Greek and Roman early texts. And those weren't necessarily clean and uh, easy on the eye. If you've been taught anything about tragedy, you'll most often be shown ancient Greek theatre as the model. But the Romans had tragedy as well, particularly we have a few works from Seneca, and the Elizabethans like to look to Seneca as well for an influence and a model. He was influenced by Greek and Roman writers and also by the fashions of the other plays around him, like Thomas Kidd's Hieronimo is Mad Again. He also was dealing with a society that had 3,000 different ways it could kill you. At the time that Shakespeare's company first performed Titus Andronicus, it was 1594 and for the previous two summer seasons, when a company like his would have been making its best money by performing in the large outdoor theatres, those theatres were closed because of plague. That's right, when Titus Andronicus came out, Shakespeare's company had just had to shut everything down for two years in order to stop the spread of a virulent disease that could take out huge chunks of the population. So round we go again. That's what you're looking at here. You're looking at the kind of theatre that was created to help satisfy people who are feeling that parts of their lives have been snatched away. Let's see if we can tie all this together by looking at a passage in the play that is actually quite difficult for a modern audience to grapple with, and it's where the violence of the revenge tragedy meets the tradition of fine rhetoric, and that's where Marcus discovers the injured Lavinia. When Lavinia's uncle finds her after she's been horrifically brutalised, we wouldn't normally think in our circumstances or our principles of drama, what we would do is that we would give a speech to explain the horror of the sight of her, our pain in seeing what she must have gone through and what we intend to do to mourn with her and help alleviate her suffering. This is just not something that modern drama would attempt. But Shakespeare's theatre didn't want to see how quickly you could progress the plot. What they wanted to see was how you could enrich the moment. They wanted to see how you could animate the ideas. So when Marcus finds Lavinia and gives this perfect but strangely detached speech about what she's been through. What an Elizabethan audience would have been enjoying, if that's even the word for this, participating in, is a journey with Marcus and Lavinia through the speech. This is a play that is born out of these multiple and varied traditions of tragedy, the Greek, the Roman, the Elizabethan revenge tragedy that later developed into the Jacobean and Shakespeare developed with it and that's why it's exciting to see this early version where you can see the structure of a tragedy being built into the bones of the play. One of the toughest things about this play is seeing the wheel of tragedy grind so inevitably and knowing that in the end it was Titus who set it rolling. No matter how horrific and undeserved the torments that man is put through, it all began when he was the one who made the decision to sacrifice the eldest son of the captive Queen of Gods. Whatever horrors come afterwards, they come at the heels of that action. One thing I love about this as an early play is that it already shows that distinctive Shakespeare quirk that he would carry with him throughout the whole of his career, which is the mashing up of the comedy into the tragedy. And he never let that go, even when he was criticised for it. It was his, it's his number one marker, and we already see it here in its extremity. 
there is no point of light between the comedy and tragedy in these scenes. The over-the-top grotesque comedy of the final scenes in Shakespeare's Titus Andronicus is not a flaw or a weakness, it is what makes the piece transcendent. I mentioned early on that this is an exceptional play for looking at Shakespeare's technique of writing from the points of view of hugely varied and contrasting characters. So in the next Titus Andronicus video, that's what we're going to focus on. We're going to look at some of the extraordinarily vivid characters from this play in some detail.